Good afternoon. This hearing will come to order. The Senate Committee on Indian Affairs was established for the primary purpose of representing the legislative and oversight priorities of Native Americans. The committee is the first stop in the Senate towards achieving these priorities and broadly fulfilling the United States' trust and treaty obligations. But Congress is capable of forgetting these obligations. Our trust and treaty obligations are not just abstract promises, they are enshrined in the United States Constitution, a constitutional mandate that committee members carry with them as they go about their work in the Senate. And when it comes to the Violence Against Women Act, Congress does not have the luxury of forgetting this mandate. That's because every member of this committee knows that public safety in Native communities is a problem. We've heard from tribal leaders, we've heard from law enforcement, and we've heard from the families of Native victims. Their message is consistent. Doing nothing is not an option. We've heard that message loud and clear in 2013 with the last VAWA reauthorization. Almost a decade ago, this committee came together on a bipartisan basis and voted to restore tribal criminal jurisdiction over non-Indians who commit domestic violence in Indian country. That vote, one of the first that I took as a new member of the Senate and of this committee, was Congress's first real step towards restoring justice for Native communities. Because before VAWA in 2013, when tribal law enforcement was called to the scene of a crime in Indian country, the officer had to figure out the nature of the crime, the status of the land where the crime occurred, whether the victim was an Indian, and whether the offender was an Indian. That meant tribal law enforcement officers, often the first responders uh, on a crime scene, had to complete a complicated mental checklist before deciding whether to arrest or detain a suspect. It's no wonder tribes had their hands tied when it came to maintaining public safety on their own lands. And the criminals exploited this jurisdictional maze, preying on native women and children and putting tribal communities in harm's way. But under VAWA 2013, tribes that opt to exercise special domestic violence criminal jurisdiction can cut through the legal red tape to enforce protective orders, protection orders, and prosecute domestic violence crimes, all while safeguarding defendants' due process and constitutional rights. For nearly a decade, tribes have made at least 396 arrests for VAWA-related crimes and at least 133 subsequent convictions using special tribal jurisdiction. And despite the concerns of some, prior to the law passing, there have been zero valid habeas corpus petitions filed and zero, zero claims of due process violation. So what we will hear today is a story of success. Each of our witnesses will underscore the importance of special jurisdiction for Indian country. They will also lay out ways that Congress can help tribes and native communities build on this success in the next VAWA reauthorization, closing jurisdictional gaps, creating parity, providing resources, and making sure that Native Americans are not invisible in public safety data. These are just a few of the common sense bipartisan solutions that our committee can and should work to advance. That's one of the many reasons I'm thankful for my partnership with Vice Chair Murkowski. She has been an extraordinary leader for Native people across the country, in Indian country, of course in Alaska, on behalf of Native Hawaiians, and especially in this case, on behalf of people who are victims of domestic violence. And we will continue to work together to make sure Indian country priorities are included in the Senate's coming Violence Against Women Act reauthorization. Finally, before I turn to Vice Chair Murkowski, I'd like to extend a special uh, welcome and thanks to our witnesses for joining us today. And I look forward to your testimony and our discussion. Vice Chair Murkowski. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And indeed, it is a genuine thank you. I wanna thank you and your team for the very cooperative work that has gone into uh, not only where we are in holding this very, very important hearing today, but in the work that we have done um, in, in preparing this draft legislation that, that has been publicly now released. It has, it's been a little bit of a long process. I think we, we would all like to, to move more quickly, um, but I think we also want to, to, 
to do good work, and, and that's what this committee is committed to, to doing. So the focus today uh, on, on uh, uh, what more we can be doing to ensure levels of protection for those who are subjected to violence in, in our Native communities, uh, what more we can be doing for, for Native women around the country. Uh, this is a key priority for us, but how we knit this into the broader VAWA picture uh, proposal is also very important. I think you've outlined, Mr. Chairman, that sometimes these issues of tribal jurisdiction are, are confusing, they're esoteric, um, but I want to emphasize that the impacts on the ground in Native communities, particularly in places like very rural Alaska, they are very real. They are very tragic. And in 2019, we had the Attorney General come out to a small Native village. He looked around, he talked to the people, he left and he declared a law enforcement emergency. It was based on the fact that Alaska has the highest per capita crime rate in the country. We face a unique jurisdictional landscape, but jurisdictional complexity should not deny safety or justice, and that's what we've seen happening. In 2013, Congress passed the Violence Against Women Act. In Title IX of VAWA 2013, as it's commonly called, Congress enacted what's been described as a partial elephant fix by recognizing the inherent authority of tribes to prosecute and punish certain domestic violence crimes committed by non-Indians against Indian women. At that time, this act was described as unprecedented. Some members of Congress and the news media pushed a narrative that tribal governments somehow would not be fair, they wouldn't safeguard the rights of non-Indian defendants, something that we all knew was far from the truth. And Mr. Chairman, as you have pointed out, eight years later, the, the parade of horrible that so many had predicted did not happen. I'm proud to report, as you have, that, and we're gonna hear from our witnesses, despite all the horror stories, non-Indian defendants experience a tribal justice system that treats them fairly, and perhaps in some ways with more attention than the state or the federal system. And that's why I believe we have a moral imperative here in Congress, that we take action to further restore and improve the implementation of this special tribal criminal law jurisdiction over non-Indians who commit violent crimes in our Native communities. I firmly believe that by empowering tribal courts in this way, we can help combat this major public safety issue that affects Native people and Native children. We know the statistics on this committee, we say them a lot, but they bear repeating. American Indians and Alaska Natives are the victims of rape, sexual assault, and domestic violence in numbers far out of proportion to the level that these crimes are committed outside of Native communities. And most often, these crimes are committed by non-Indian men. In Alaska, the rates of violence experienced by Alaska Natives are horrific. There's no other word than horrific. According to a report prepared by the Indian Law and Order Commission, Alaska Native women are overrepresented by nearly 250 percent among women domestic violence victims in our country. Most Native communities in rural Alaska have no local law enforcement physically presence. One out of three Native communities, one out of three, has no local law enforcement that is physically there. So think about what that means if you are a victim of violence in your home, if your children have been targeted and there is no presence for law enforcement. And currently Alaska tribes, many of the tribes don't have the tools that they need to address this violence in our tribal communities. Only one Alaska tribe could potentially implement the special jurisdiction. This is wrong. And we have recognized that, and we have to make it right. And we need to do it in a way that recognizes the unique jurisdictional situation that we have in Alaska, where PL-280 state Alaska is. The Alaska Native Claims Settlement Act, ANCSA, is going to be celebrating its 50th anniversary just this next, next week. But it created a new and different approach to tribal land tenure from the lower 48 reservation system. Um, I know it still comes as a surprise to some, but we have 
We've got half the tribes in, in the entire country, but we only have one Indian reservation in our state. After the U.S. Supreme Court decision in the Venati case, in which the court held that Anxa lands are not Indian country, it became the state's duty, largely alone, to provide for public safety and justice for Alaska Natives. So we're, a, we're in a situation that just isn't tenable right now. But I'm happy to report that we have an Alaska solution to this complex jurisdictional situation in our state. And we're calling it the Alaska Public Safety Empowerment Pilot Project. We're rolling it out as a part of the discussion draft uh, text title for, for folks to see. Give us your feedback on it. It builds on previous legislation that you've seen from me. It's the product of years years of work with tribal advocates and smart lawyers. We're going to be able to hear from Michelle Demert as part of this panel. She has been a great help. But this pilot project will empower a limited number of Alaska tribes to exercise special criminal jurisdiction over certain crimes that occur in villages in Alaska. These tribes will have to meet certain criteria, including having a tribal justice system that can adequately safeguard the rights of defendants. But I am absolutely confident, absolutely confident, that Alaska tribes are up to this task. Overall, I think we've got a unique opportunity here, working in a cooperative and a bipartisan way to make a positive difference in the safety of our Native communities for Native women and children across our country. And I hope, I hope, Mr. Chairman, that we seize it. So again, I want to thank the witnesses for participating today. Uh, especially Michelle Demert of the Alaska Native Women's Resource, Resource Center. Um, Mr. Mr. Chairman, thank you for uh, helping in such a strong and constructive way to get us here today. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Chair Murkowski. Uh, Senator Tester would like to uh, introduce one of the witnesses for us. Yeah, I got a real brief opening statement, but first of all, I want to thank you, Mr. Chairman and Ranking Member Murkowski for all the good work that you've done on this committee and particularly on this issue. Uh, there's seven people on the witness list today, two of them in person and welcome, and five of them virtually, so there's a wealth of information we can get. And I would also like to welcome the Montanans we have in the house today. I appreciate you folks being here. Uh, look, it is very important to have this hearing. Um, the Violence Against Women Act saves lives, plain and simple, reauthorization of VAWA is long overdue and without reauthorization, the life-saving resources that it offers are put to risk. Uh, tribal sovereignty needs to be in the forefront of these discussions around VAWA uh, uh, reauthorization and rightfully so, because when it comes to making decisions about Indian country, uh, tribes need to be the ones driving the bus. This being said, it is my pleasure to introduce Chief Judge Stacy Forstar today, someone who knows about what it takes to make these critical decisions. She is a member of the Fort Beck, Assiniboine, and Sioux tribes who specialize in Indian law. While working in her home community, she has served as prosecutor, as an associate judge, and now holds the office of chief judge at Fort Peck tribes. She has been a key player in implementing VAWA for the tribe since it was accepted into a pilot program back in 2015. All is wish to say, she knows uh, what she's talking about, and I look forward to hearing from Chief Forstar and the other six witnesses here today. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Tester. Senator Lujan for an opening statement. Thank you, Chair Schatz and Vice Chair Murkowski for holding this hearing to examine the tribal title of the Violence Against Women Act reauthorization. And thank you for our witnesses for joining us today. I would like to welcome Elizabeth Rhee Shampovi of Nambe Pueblo, and also introduce Governor Michael Chavarria of Santa Clara Pueblo. Santa Clara Pueblo is the first and only Pueblo or tribe in New Mexico to exercise special domestic violence criminal jurisdiction under the Violence Against Women Act. As governor from 2006 to 2008 and 14 to 2021, Governor Chavarria oversaw the implementation of the criminal jurisdiction, creating a new tribal code in 2020 to meet federal standards under VAWA directing federal grant funding to train judges and defense counsel and law enforcement personnel for this purpose. It's my pleasure and honor to have you here today, Governor, and I look forward to highlighting the Pueblo's leadership and exercising this jurisdiction and how the Native Youth and Tribal Officer Protection Act I introduced today will fill in many of the gaps left in place by the 2013 VAWA. Thank you, Chair, and I yield back. Thank you, Senator Lujan. I'll now 
turn to our witnesses. Uh, we have seven. Uh, Allison Randall, Principal Deputy Director, Office of Violence Against Women in the U.S. Department of Justice. Uh, Wizipan Little Elk Garriott, Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary, Indian Affairs at the U.S. Department of Interior. J. Michael Chavarria, Governor, Santa Clara Pueblo, Española, New Mexico. Fawn Sharp, President, the National Congress of American Indians. Stacy Forstar, Chief Judge, Fort Peck, Assiniboine, and Sioux Tribes, uh, Poplar, uh, Montana. Elizabeth Reese, Assistant Professor of Law at Stanford University. Michelle Demerit, uh, Director, Law and Policy Center, Alaska Native Women's Resource Center in Fairbanks, Alaska. I want to remind our witnesses that your full written testimony will be made part of the official hearing record. Uh, please confine your remarks to five minutes exactly or less if you can. Uh, and Principal Deputy Director Randall, the committee's rules, uh, uh, specifically Rule 4B, requires that if a federal witness misses the committee's 48-hour deadline for submission of testimony, the witness must state on the record why the testimony was late. P please be prepared to start your testimony with an explanation on why you were unable to comply with the committee's rule. Uh, 